we have Michael Green, who is coming from London to talk about something very interesting on social progress. Social progress is a body of work that we did for the Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, wherein we actually talked about issues of districts and states and to, uh, as to how things have improved in India. Uh, if you really look at a period from 2017 to 2022, we do see some remarkable progress. We actually try to do some uh, uh, what I call assessment across aspirational districts as well. But those are separate issues, but I think that is where uh, Michael will actually come in. Michael is the CEO for the Social Progress Index, has worked with uh, Mike Porter to really create this over a period of time. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have worked together on a lot of uh, things together, a lot of pieces together. So we've been uh, co-authors as well. We did this whole aspirational district assessment work. We did the Social Progress Index together. But Michael, such a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. Over to you, please. I mean, thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here, and uh, special thanks to our host for organising some English weather for us this morning. <laughs> Made me feel very at home. And thank you, Sanjeev, for such a terrific uh, presentation. It reminded me I'm a, I used to work in the British government, so I'm a recovering bureaucrat. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm an optimist, because so many of the problems we have are stupid problems. They aren't, don't require rocket science to fix them. They're actually very fixable problem, and I think you've illustrated that beautifully. Now, can I just grab the pinger off you, Sanjeev? Um, eh? Thank you so much. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, the elephant. I think we've agreed it's moving. Um, Mr. Amitabh Kant yesterday with characteristic vigour described India taking off like a rocket, perhaps to the south pole of the moon. But others said that the India is moving backwards. So what I want to do is offer a perspective on where India is moving through the lens of the social progress index. As Amit said, this is a tool we developed a few years ago with Mike Porter of Harvard Business School. The idea was to create a comprehensive measure of social progress independent of economic indicators. So that's the key thing to know about social progress index. No GDP, no economic indicators in the model. That way we can look at the relationship between economic progress and social progress in a rigorous manner. It all draws on secondary data and measures outcomes. So we're avoiding policy judgments about how much money is spent, which laws are passed. You can't game the social progress index except by improving the outcomes for people. We've structured around these three dimensions, basic needs, food, water, shelter, safety, foundations of well-being, education, access to information, health, and the environment, and thirdly, opportunity in terms of rights, freedoms, inclusiveness, and advanced education. This framework comes from literature. We've tested it extensively and maps pretty well against the sustainable development goals if you want to speak that language. Um, I won't go into the details about the methodology. It's all on our website in excruciating detail. But I want to show you what we find. And if we're going to talk about the social progress index, I want to do it through three lenses. I'm going to walk you through three steps. We've created a long-term time series social progress index 1990 to 2020. We've got our kind of flagship project is, is a global social progress index 2011 to 2023. And we've also got the work doing social progress measures for states and districts of India. So let's start with the long-term story, 1990 to 2020. And if we're going to talk about India's progress over those 30 years, where do we start? Of course, we start with China, because this is the big contrast. We've talked about it a lot. China has really sort of taken off over that 30-year period. What I've done here, I've put GDP, just for information on the, in the red, and social progress in blue. And I've set the values for both in 1990 as one, and then just index the change. And here we see the Chinese economy shooting up, yeah, growing 11 times over this period. Social progress follows more slowly and has increased about 70% over this period. This is China's story. How does India compare? Well, at first glance, it looks a bit sad. Yeah? Uh, India's economy has grown three and a half times, perhaps, and social progress has gone up about 50% in this period. But look at these two pictures. Here's India, here's China. I would say what this shows is how China has wasted its opportunity, that this has been the most unproductive economic growth in terms of delivering social progress and that this is actually a trap that India needs to avoid. To have, you can have spectacular growth without social progress is a policy failure. 
And Mr. Count, you talked yesterday a lot about inclusive growth and that hardwiring inclusive social pro progress delivering growth is going to be so important for India. So I think China has a cautionary le lesson for India in the next phase of development. Okay, let's move on. Let's look now at a, bring it a bit more up to date, 2011 to 2023. First thing I want to highlight here is that actually we've had a, gone through a rough period for global social progress. Indeed, last year, the first time we've observed this, we've actually seen global social progress going backwards. Really around two effects. One is that we're seeing human rights declining in many countries, and then we're also seeing the health effects of COVID coming through. And that's led the world score of social progress to decline for the first time. And actually, that maps pretty well onto what we saw with India as well. Is this particularly on the health side? We've seen the after effects of COVID have been particularly marked in India compared to other countries. And that's pulled India's score down in the last year. You could say over this period that perhaps China hasn't really extended its lead over, over India, but nor has India been catching up. The question is, what's going to happen after this? If we break this down a bit further, um, what I've done here is just said, how does India compare to its peers? So in terms of rankings over this period, 2011 to 2023. And I've broken it down by the different components of the Social Progress Index. So this gives a sense of relative performance of India over this period. And starting on the left, we see that actually 2011 to 2023, India gained seven places in the rankings. So India was moving faster than its peers overall. Although quite strikingly, a lot of the progress was in basic human needs, pretty much no progress in foundations of well-being, and then going backwards on opportunity. We break it out that we can see a bit more. First of all, nutrition and medical care seems to have been sort of not really, just gone down a little bit. But as Mr. Camp was saying yesterday, in water and sanitation and housing, we've seen big gains for India, reflecting those investments. And housing will also reflect the investments in electricity supply, etc. Then the next one we see is actually safety and how India has gone backwards on safety. I looked at the numbers and actually what we see is that what's happened is that India has stood still in absolute terms, whereas other countries have made improvements. This could be violent crime, domestic violence, theft, and uh, road traffic accidents. In all those areas, there hasn't been a lot of improvement. And I don't think sort of safety and security is something we've talked about much at this conference so far, but interesting one where India's falling behind. Education, we see gains. Um, information and communications, we see a decline. This is really around press freedom. Uh, we see gains in health, despite the problems with health post-COVID, health in India has improved. And then environmental quality has stayed pretty much where it was. Moving on to opportunity, we see a decline in rights, which I know is a particular issue and has some controversy. On the other hand, freedom and choice has seen a big increase. Big factor there, um, early marriage, reduction in early marriage, child brides uh, has improved that score. Inclusiveness has improved, largely driven by increased acceptance of uh, LGBT community. And the final one I found was really interesting was higher education, um, is actually how many ranks India has fallen in this. Now, the absolute score hasn't declined. It's just other countries are investing in higher education faster than India is. And so India is actually losing ground there. And again, I don't think that's something we've talked about much at this conference. I want to put one other lens on the data for comparison, which is to look at India's social progress scorecard. And this is what we do. Don't be scared. I won't go through all the detail. So what we do here is we compare a country to its 15 closest peers in GDP per capita. So it's a bit like boxing. We compare economic heavyweights to economic heavyweights, economic lightweights to economic lightweights. So we're comparing and benchmarking India's performance against its economic peers. We have a traffic light system. Red is bad. We actually have blue is good to help people who are colorblind like me, and yellow is sort of neutral. Now, People, I know, people will want to get a, a, you know, a, a, a grade and may not be satisfied with India's overall score as being yellow in the neutral zone. But actually, that's very good. Uh, most big countries struggle to deliver on social progress, and most big countries actually underperform relative to their peers. China underperforms. The United States underperforms. So the fact that India is performing within the expected range is actually quite a good performance. 
we see in generally most of the performance was in the ex expected range, even where the areas where India has been going backwards. So perhaps where we've seen declines in ranking, it's India has been ahead and has gone back a bit. But the one I want to highlight where we see a real concentration of reds is around environmental quality. Now, we don't look at greenhouse gas emissions in this framework. We look more about environmental factors actually directly impact on people's life. So it's lead exposure, particulate air exposure, but also biodiversity and other indicators. In here, India is standing still at the back of the pack. And if we're thinking about challenges around education and health, dealing with these environmental problems is actually going to have a catalytic effect on these. So the environment is an area that looks like a priority for improvement for India. Okay, that's the national picture. That's how the, uh, the elephant is moving. Uh, let's have a look at how the herd of elephants is moving, the states and districts of India. This is work we did with the Institute of Competitiveness under the sponsorship of the uh, EACPM. Um, and it takes the same framework, but it takes Indian official data to measure each of these 12 components. Again, there's a very large report. It makes a beautiful, goes beautifully on a coffee table, and it's got all the details in this if you want to read it. It's on the EACPM website. 89 indicators measuring social progress across the states and union territories of India. And what we did was we broke their scores down into six tiers based on natural clusters in the data. And so, the state or union territory with the highest social progress score in India is Puducherry. <laughs> is there anyone here from Puducherry? <laughs> the second highest is Lakshadweep. Anyone here from Lakshadweep? <laughs> no. Um, Goa. Anyone here from Goa? A third. No, of course not, because of course what you'll have noticed is these are all small places. Most of this top tier, Tamil Nadu accepted, are smaller places. And we do know it's easier to get things done in smaller places. Smaller places tend to have higher social progress. And we see that echoed a bit if we look at the second tier. Again, a lot of smaller places there. When we get to the third tier, then we finally see Delhi comes through, only in the third tier of social progress. Um, and then fourth tier, we see some of the big states um, coming through, and there's Haryana, Maharashtra, uh, others. And then we've got a sort of a small tail, uh, fifth tier, Uttar Pradesh, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, and then bringing up the rear, Assam, Bihar, and Jharkhand. Now, I'm not an expert on economic geography India, so I've gone through that rather quickly. You will all know more about this than I do. What I want to show you, though, is if we look at these results and compare it to state gross domestic product per capita. And what we see is that, yes, broadly, richer states do better. There's Goa, very rich, very high social progress. On the other hand, here's Bihar, very poor, very low social progress. But there's also a huge amount of noise around this. GDP is not destiny. The policy choices really matter. It's not just economic growth automatically leads to social outcomes. It's the policy choices we make about how we build our economy and how we redistribute resources. Just to, I've highlighted three here. There's Delhi. Actually, like a lot of capital cities, a lot of GDP, but actually struggling on social progress. Puducherry, higher social progress, but nowhere near the richest of the states or union territories. And there's Manipur, same social progress as Delhi, but with... Uh, a much lower level of GDP. And all you could run that down, and there's Jharkhand. Jharkhand is no richer than Manipur, but there's a huge gulf in its social progress. So policy choices matter about how we distribute the economic benefits to deliver real outcomes for people in terms of quality of life. And we can roll this over again. Uh, we can look for each of these, these states with a, a scorecard. I won't talk about there. There's Puducherry. There's Delhi's awfully red. Yeah. So for each of those, you've got a scorecard showing the strengths and weaknesses. And then what we can also do is take it down to the district level. Not all the same data is available for districts or states, so it's a slightly more limited framework of 49 indicators. And I can't take you through all, uh, all the districts of India. But just to quickly show you, the best performing districts, broadly you will see, are in the best performing states. The worst performing districts, tend to be in the worst performing states. But it's not fixed like that. Let me give you one case study here. Here's Maharashtra. And you've got districts 
in every single tier within this state. Now, this is extraordinary. So with one state, you've got the full range from lowest to highest levels of social progress. And that's a policy problem. And I know it's one that the government of India is interested in. Things like the aspirational districts program is all about how do you pull up those lowest performing states, the districts. Because there's a huge opportunity here. If you've got low performing districts, there's a chance for them to catch up quite quickly, which will improve the overall social progress quite quickly. And indeed, we work, this tool is used by the European Commission for regional policy within the European Union. And one of the senior officials in the EU made a very important point to me, which is equalizing GDP across the territories of the European Union is impossible. You will always have certain geographic advantage, cluster advantages. There'll always be differences in GDP across the country, a country of the size of India. But equalizing social progress across the territory of a country is a meaningful and tangible policy goal. And so there's a real opportunity here about pulling up these least performing districts to actually then that will enhance the social progress of India more broadly. And this mapping helps to highlight this. I want to finish um, just with the words of our chief advisor on the project, Michael Porter. And Michael Porter really drove this idea around you know, creating a social progress index to complement economic measurement. Because progress really is about social and economic development. And one thing Michael always said was that you've got to remember is the causation grows both, goes both ways. Social progress actually is a driver of long-term competitiveness. That was his strong view. And we heard a bit yesterday about peak China. And I do wonder if we're thinking about peak China. Is actually its lack of investment in social progress part of the cause of its problems? And if India is to make sure that peak India happens as far off in the future as possible, then investing in social progress has got to be part of that long-term strategy. Thank you very much.